Well, welcome everyone to our second day of our symposium. I hope you enjoyed last night's keynote address and the presentations that came beforehand. We're going for our two this morning, so um, we'll briefly start. Before I invite Professor Jim Harris, who is the Director of, the, uh, of Research at the Sydney College of Divinity, to introduce uh, Reverend Professor Gerald O. Collins, I'd like to invite Father Anastasio Sposikis up to the, to, to the podium. Uh, he is our lecturer in church history, just to read uh, the things welcome. So, Father Anastasio. A welcome from His Eminence Archbishop Macarius, uh, the Dean of St. Andrew's Theological College who unfortunately was unable to be with us uh, this weekend as he is uh, leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and Constantinople. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the third Theology Symposium of St. Andrew's Theological College, the theme of which is the importance of Christology for the 21st century. With the institution of our theology, as well as our patristic symposia over a decade ago, St. Andrews hoped to provide a forum for serious theological dialogue by academics from all Christian traditions from within Australia and abroad on some of the most important tenets of the Christian faith. Indeed, it was further envisaged that this theological exploration would focus its attention on their salvific and existential significance for the contemporary world. I am very pleased that this primary objective has been achieved through these symposia of our college over the years. I am particularly delighted with the main theme of this symposium as reflection on the person and saving work of Jesus Christ constitutes the starting point and end point of all theological discourse since Christ is the Alpha and the Omega of all authentic theology. Not only can there be no Christian doctrine without Christology, since this is the central and defining teaching, teaching of Christian theology, but there can be no future for the Church without continued and constructive theological consideration on the crucified and risen Christ. Today, some 2,000 years later, we are also called to respond to the question asked by Christ on his way to Caesarea Philippi. But who do you say that I am? With this in mind, I am especially excited with our two keynote speakers, both of whom have made remarkable contributions in the area of Christology, as is well attested in their publications. The Reverend Professor Dimitrios Patrelos hails from Greece, where he teaches at the Greek Open University in Bakr, the Cambridge Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies, and the University in London, where he has been visiting a visiting research fellow of King's College. He has published widely in this area and looks forward to his book and looks forward to his forthcoming publication of a work specifically looking at the sinlessness of Christ through all Oxford University Press. The Reverend Professor Gerald O'Collins, an Australian Jesuit priest, currently research professor and writer in residence at the Jesuit Theological College, University of Divinity in Melbourne, is without question the leading theologian of Australia in the area of Christology. For this reason, we look forward to his theological exploration of the scriptures as they relate to the central tenet of the Christian faith in Jesus Christ as the crucified and exalted Lord. It is indeed a source of great pleasure for the community of St. Andrews that both keynote speakers will be with us for these few days and we look forward to being stimulated and challenged by their respective lectures and being exposed to what I'm sure will be nothing less 
than pioneering scholarship in this domain. In addition to the keynote presentations, there are other specialist papers on a wide and broad range of topics in the area of Christology. It is the fervent hope of the College that this plurality and interdisciplinary exchange will result both in deepening and enriching our understanding of this central teaching of the Christian faith, and equally importantly doing so in such a way that will continue to affirm and give witness to the transformative power of the Word. Indeed, a life-giving Word, which proclaims Christ's death as the source of life to all those who freely take up their cross and follow Him. As always, I would like to express the College's gratitude to all those who have worked tirelessly for the success of this symposium, the conveners, the organising committee, and all who have worked behind the scenes in one way or another. I pray for Christ's richest blessings upon you all. Archbishop Macarius of Australia, Dean. Thank you, Father. And without further ado, I invite Professor Jim to come and introduce our second keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, and uh, <coughs> everyone. And, uh, and another exciting uh, new day ahead of us. And it's a uh, whole to me, it's a great privilege and honour uh, and pleasure to introduce to you all Professor Jared O'Collins. He's a research professor and writer in residence at the Jesuit Theological College in Melbourne. He is also an adjunct professor at the Australian Catholic University. He studied at the University of Melbourne, achieving a first class honours baccalaureate degree and a master's degree. Ordained a Roman Catholic priest in 1963, he received his doctorate in theology at Cambridge in 1987. A series of teaching posts then eventually Western School of Theology, the Boston Theological Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Jesuit College in Melbourne. However, his life's teaching and academic work was to be based overseas, where he became Professor of Systematic and Fundamental Theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University at Rome. This singular academic honour has been supplemented by a wide array of honorary degrees and prizes awarded to him, as well as his extensive service to the worldwide church by initiating and co-chairing many international ecumenical symposia throughout his career. A consistent focus of his prolific academic publishing career, uh, I'm guessing well over 60 books now, uh, I don't know. <laughs> How many? 74. 74. Wow. <laughs> uh, and it has been his focus on Christology. First of all, there was the acclaimed Christology, a biblical, historical, and systematic study of Jesus Christ in 1995. Jesus, a portrait in 2008. More recently, Jesus, our priest, a Christian approach to the priesthood of Christ, 2010. We are deeply thankful, Professor O'Collins, for your willingness to deliver a keynote address at our conference. We thank you not only for your prodigious scholarship, but also for your warmth, your encouragement of others, and for the raising up of many generations of biblical scholars. Ladies and gentlemen, let's just uh, greet Professor O'Collins in the typical way as he comes to deliver his lecture, New Testament Scholarship Supports Christology.
occasion to speak at St Andrew's Symposium and on a very central topic, Christology and the importance of biblical scholarship for the development of Christology. You could say that equivalently, I'm attending to the Jesus of history who supports believers in the Christ, their faith in Christ, the Christ of faith. Historians do or should support, biblical scholars also should support what believers hold. It should be a smooth passage from the Jesus of history to the Christ of faith. Of course, there are other things that come into play here, notably the experience of worship and the example of saints. The other day we had Chris Lowry, a notable American lecturer on the governance of the church speaking in Melbourne. And he asked the question, what does the church need? Well, I said, I think it needs above all saints. Other things are relative to that. The more real saints like Dorothy Day and Jean Vanier that appear among us, the better. As you can see on that guide sheet, I want to say a little bit about terminology before I give examples of how New Testament scholarship, biblical scholarship, can support Christology. First of all, the term theology has been classically understood as faith seeking understanding. Faith is very important there because the analogy I sometimes use is that of people who teach drama at a university. And uh, if they never go downtown to the theatre, something essential is missing. If I were a committee to appoint somebody to a chair of drama, and the chap knew everything about Aeschylus and Shakespeare and the rest, but never went to the theatre, I'd certainly vote against appointing him. That he would be lacking life. He needs to be with the dramatic community. Likewise, theologians, yes, one foot's in the academic sphere, and the other one should be in the worshiping. Historically, John the Evangelist has been called the, the theologian, and he's a wonderful example of faith in the incarnate Christ seeking understanding. He's a supreme example of why at the beginning of Christianity what it is to be a theologian. And Christology points to who Christ is and what he is, who he is in himself and what he is in himself. One acting person who is both truly divine and truly human. We have a wonderful summary of all that in the Council of Chalcedon, of course. One thing I cherish about Chalcedon's definition is its openness. Perfect in humanity, perfect in divinity. One person, two natures. It offers a variety of ways of speaking about Christ. It doesn't impose one way and say this is the only language to use. There's a certain delightful ecumenical openness there, I think, in the famous, wonderful account from the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So Christology is seeking an understanding of the person and nature of Christ. Then you have, of course, the third term, soteriology. It's closely related to Christology. It examines what Christ has done for us, pro nobis. What Christ has done, yes, for human beings, but also for their world. Nowadays, with greater sensitivity, thank God, to issues of climate and the environment and so on, what Christ has done for the world, the sense that was inculcated by Athanasius about the seeds of the word being distributed everywhere, has assumed a new and radical importance. So sexuality is broad, it's not only for the human beings, but also for their environment, our wonderful created world. In theology, one can distinguish, but should never separate Christology and soteriology. I was very delighted to find that coming up yesterday in the various presentations. The emphasis on holding together Christ in himself and Christ for us. Christology and soteriology link, distinguish, but never to be separated. New Testament studies, I think, do help us to uh, develop our Christology. They do support it and throw light on it. To be quite honest, I don't read that many theologians. I read Caruana, but I read devout biblical commentaries. I find people like Joel Marcus on uh, Mark's Gospel and 
the late uh, Francois Beauvoir on Luke, and then Ulrich Lutz on Matthew. I find new and fresh things there, exciting insights into Scripture. Uh, last year I did a book on the inspiration of the Scriptures, stressing the way in which inspiration is not simply the, the, having its input in the writing of the Scriptures, but also in the reading. The same Holy Spirit who was present there helping Luther and the rest of them is also there to help us, help the wider church understand the Scriptures to be nourished by them. I understand scriptures in the sense also the religious art, icons and the rest that the scriptures have given birth to. I think there's an enormous amount still to be done on the reception of the scriptures as part of the account that one gives of the inspiration of the scriptures. It's one thing simply to inspire the text, but the Holy Spirit also has to inspire the hearers, the readers, the preachers, the artists, the composers of music, and all the rest who have taken the sacred text as their central theme. Well, so much for terminology. Let me turn now to the New Testament and the ways in which scholarship can help us in understanding who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And I concentrate here on Matthew, Mark and Luke. That's not to reject John's gospel, not to reject it or doubt its historical significance. I think there's a much happier balance today in understanding John as historical and theological. But it's easier to take the earlier Gospels, Mark, and then followed by Matthew and Luke, and they provide us with sufficient material, not just for a lecture, but for a course. Uh, I understand Mark to be the first, and Matthew and Luke among the sources they use to use Mark. In England, I used to go to a lovely preacher, a lovely retreat house in the west of England in Somerset, and Occasionally, Lord Hailsham was there. He'd been the, I think it's what we call the Lord, the Lord Chancellor of England. And he said to me one day that, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were brought up before me, I'd see it was a case of plagiarism. Somebody was copying somebody else. He, he agreed with the generally held view. You can't prove it absolutely that Mark came first and then was used, among other sources, by Matthew and Luke. Other sources, including eyewitnesses. We've been blessed by a return to that uh, theme, the eyewitnesses of the Gospels by somebody whose name I've neglected to put on the guide sheet, Richard Borkel. Uh, he's now retired, a professor in Cambridge and up there in St Andrews. So let's use Matthew, Mark and Luke to think about that the earlier sources and they're sufficient for our purposes what light do they throw on Jesus' self-understanding? How did he understand his uh, saving mission? Of course we can't give a complete account of what was there in his human consciousness and in his divine consciousness, that's even more difficult. But how did he understand his saving mission? Are there, are there hints and uh, insights available here and there? I'm afraid a few people don't like attempting to reflect on the self-consciousness of Jesus, they think you want to provide a full-blooded uh, psychological profile. Of course you can't do that, but not being able to do the whole thing doesn't mean you can't do something. And also, it's important to reflect on how the first Christians identified. Right from the, the days when Mary Magdalene and Andrew and Peter met Jesus, they began interpreting it. Here he was person they threw in their lot with, and bit by bit they, their, their interpretations converged, but each of them had their own personal take on him. That's the way human knowledge and knowledge of interpersonal knowledge works. <coughs> but what about the identity of the historical Jesus? Every now and then we have these sensational books that uh, Jesus was simply a teacher of ethics, or merely a final prophet, as with Aslan, merely a zealot, or he was a, merely simply a wandering worker of miracles. And according to that view, Paul and John in particular, they're credited with having turned Jesus into a divine figure. They created a Christ of faith who hadn't been there before. They misrepresented the true Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, faith in the, Jesus as divine Lord and Son of God, that's created according to them, by Paul and Luke. 
And the later passages from Paul and Luke call out that later because Paul's the first Christian writer. They're misrepresenting the human Jesus and giving us a false view of him as the divine Son of God and Lord. Well, does that view work? And uh, every year or two, along comes a sensational book. I'm waiting for one to turn up now. We haven't had one for two or three years. <laughs> Normally, they take the form of uh, rejecting the resurrection. In the 19th century, Albert Schweitzer wrote a remarkable book, 1906, remarkable book on the study of the historical Jesus. And he picked up a character called Venturini, who, despite his Italian name, is German. And he developed the thesis that Jesus has taken down a life from the cross and uh, revived. And then the Christian movement began by this mistaken idea that he'd been raised from the dead. And Albert Schweitzer gave an account of Venturini's thesis and what was wrong with it. And then at the end of that chapter in his great book, he said, no work has been so plagiarized. It's reissued every year over another name. And how true that is. That, uh, Writer after writer, some notable ones like D.H. Lawrence and, and some biblical uh, teachers have developed that. And I'm waiting for another version of that to turn up. Sometimes when, uh, they claim that when Jesus was uh, revived, he departed then for India or, or Japan or, or France or somewhere else, or went off to the Essenes to the Dead Sea. Well, I think good, good biblical scholarship answers that there is misrepresentations of the early Christian faith in him and also in what Jesus said, did and experienced notably. Well then what did he actually what did he hint at in self-consciousness? Was he merely an ethical teacher, merely a prophet, merely a worker of miracles? Of course he was those things. He did work miracles. He, he did speak in a prophetic way and so on, but is that the full story about him? Jesus sometimes talks about his mission as having been sent, that uh, the those who welcome me and welcome not me, but the one who sent me. And that kind of language is the language that an Old Testament prophet used, commissioned and sent by God. But alongside that language, we have Jesus also talking about himself as having come. I have come call not the righteous but sinners. I've come to bring fire to the earth. That's the kind of language we don't find the Old Testament prophets use. None of them claim to have come in their own name. They were sent by God, commissioned by God, and notably the prophets that generally are a commissioning uh, narrative which is very notable. But Jesus goes beyond that language of being sent to use this language of self-initiative, coming. He came in his own name. And who did he think he was if he used on occasions that kind of language about a mission that he himself had initiated? And then you have the kingdom of God. The reign of God is the central theme of Jesus' preaching, his miracles and, and parables and so on. And you pull out the theme of the kingdom of God, you've got not much left in the Gospels. It's the very heart of the message. He preaches the present kingdom, uh, and also the kingdom that has not yet come. That distinction was made by, was it Oscar Kuhlman and others years ago about the not, the already and the not yet, still does work, but for a point, kingdom being already present and the kingdom in which we pray thy kingdom come. And in his pre preaching, Jesus understood himself to be uh, inseparably connected with the inbreaking of the divine kingdom. In his person, he was making God's reign present. And he identified himself with that message of God's kingdom. That those who responded to the message of the kingdom, what should they do? They should become disciples of Jesus. It's not that they go off and do other things. Responding to the kingdom of God is becoming a follower of Jesus, one of those men and women disciples who followed him around. And that allowed him to claim an extraordinary authority that, uh, yes, he, was, he endorsed the commandment of love your parents, love your father and mother, but at the same time, he was establishing a new final family. Here is my mother and my brothers and sisters. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and mother and sister. 
In other words, he was breaking or overriding the normal ties of human life. In that society, and also in other societies, human relationships between the family are of paramount importance, but Jesus placed relationships with him above them. So who did he think he was when discipleship, following Jesus meant uh, overriding, going beyond the ties of family, and being willing to lose everything in his service? He relativized the rules and roles and relationships of society. So he was out of conformity with his own culture, not to mention other cultures. And that leaves us with the question, who did he think he was if he could take upon himself such an invitation? Then we to his miracles briefly. Apparently there were miracles in, in Judaism, there were miracle workers like Onias the rainmaker. Remember the chapter, during the time of drought, he drew a circle, sat inside it and prayed to God, send rain. But a few drops fell. He said, come on, he said, and he prayed again to God, and then it was a deluge. He said, please. And then finally, God got it right, and it was a reasonable kind of rain. But what, what we have in those stories of Jewish miracle workers around the time of Christ is that they invoke God, as happens elsewhere. Miracle workers are not doing it in their own name, but calling upon the divinity that God can bring about some happy result. But Jesus, he simply went ahead and worked miracles in his own name. That uh, uh, he, he just told people with authority to get up and take their pallet or, uh, or to whatever. That it was in his own name that he worked miracles, not, not through invoking God. And that again leaves us with a question. But what about his teachings? There's a remarkable series of <coughs> I've saved you in the Seven on the Mount. Ernest Kaiser didn't do much study in Jubilee, and he used to make a lot of those. Of old it was said to you, and I say to you. Of old it was said to you, you know, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, love your enemies. Very radical demand, part of that impossible teaching coming from Jesus. And who did he understand himself to be if he could set aside the divine law with I say to you? Of old, yes, through Moses, God had given them this law, these commandments that Jesus, in an antithesis, insists that, you know, he is uh, passing beyond that. You shall not murder, and so on, but I say to you, don't be angry with your brother, or you'll be liable to judgment. Another interesting thing about the teaching of Jesus is the use of Amen. We're prefacing his teaching with Amen, I say to you. That's not completely without background in uh, the Old Testament, but it's very rare, and it certainly is a way of drawing attention to personal authority. Normally speaking, people use amen as we do today at the end of a prayer, you know, affirming something that's been said or prayed, but Jesus puts the amen at the beginning. And of course, in John's Gospel, it's double amen, amen. So it gives a special authority to what has been proposed and taught, not completely without precedent, but a remarkable claim to authority. Next I'd like to point out, move on to the things that Jesus claimed authority over. The temple, the, the Sabbath, the law, and the forgiveness of sins. Well, first of all, the, uh, he claimed authority over the Sabbath. He presented himself as the Lord of the Sabbath in Mark chapter 12. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Very interesting reaction to uh, people who are criticizing his disciples from harvesting some of the grain in fields that they pass through. I mean, it's one of the only of those fields that mentioned was Jesus going to offer reparation to damage the crops, but that's irrelevant to the story. But, you know, were they breaking the Sabbath regulation against work by feeding themselves? And he appeals to precedent to what David did going into the temple. But he also appeals to his own authority. These people are with him because they're following him, the Son of Man, who is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So he's claiming the prerogative of over the sacred day. It's not just the... And also he did that, as we remember, with some of his miracles, like the man with the withered hand. Of course he could have waited the following day. It's a disability, but it's not a life-threatening situation to have a, have a withered limb. 
but he, he was so keen on life, he was, that he heals the man and the, the limb is restored, or was restored. Even that, like that bird in that story about the man with the withered hand, it was restored, it's very suggestive. That uh, it's a divine passage. Over and over again in the New Testament, you get these passages like the stone was rolled away when the women come to the tomb in Mark chapter 16. And of course, you say rolled away by God. One other said that the angel would be divine. And uh, so the divine passage, it's right there in this miracle when Jesus healed the man with a withered hand. Uh, it was restored. It was restored by divine power. Divine power coming from Jesus. It's left there as tantalizing, questioning, to be filled out by the reader. Then Jesus claimed personal authority over the temple. He uh, entered the temple, taught there, and then of course he out those who were selling and buying uh, animals and changing coins in the temple. He made himself the Lord of the temple. John has that happening at the beginning of his ministry, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke was at the end. John may be more historical here, uh, that I just want to account for the hostility that the Jew, Jew, Jerusalem authority sh showed towards Jesus and makes more sense in the sense that he'd done something strikingly offensive at the beginning of his ministry. It accounts mostly for the hostility with which they followed him in the months and years to come. In the temple he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And then he talks about the destruction of the temple. It's very hard to settle precisely what he said, but one thing is clear that he was not, he was putting in doubt the central place of the temple in Jewish life and worship. He wasn't like a, a, a Davidic Messiah coming there to build or restore the temple, but in some sense a destroyer of the temple. And um, yes, the precise words are one thing, but replacing the temple is another. And he's claiming the authority to replace temple and temple worship and do it you know, in, in a way that was, came from his own personal authority. And then he's overriding the law about things like divorce and food and retribution of all uh, who said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, you know, he, he just replaces the law. It's very striking in the case of food, at least Mark found that, that Jesus was declaring all food to be clean. So once again the question arises, someone who teaches in that way, what if he sense of his own personal authority and identity? So you find him asserting authority over time, over the Sabbath, over places, the temple, and over law, over the divine law, the sacred law of the heart of Jewish life. It's no accident you had that wonderful uh, long psalm, it's 117, the, the longest psalm, it's over 150 verses, celebrating the great gift of God, the law. Firstly, you know, in, in reciting the psalms, I like generally put the name of Jesus in there. It makes very good sense in, the, in that great psalm about the law. You have uh, elegant equivalents like word, promise, ordinance, and so on instead of just using the word law all the time. And it makes very good sense to put in the name of Jesus. And you do get a sense there of how precious the law was for the Jewish uh, believers and uh, members of the, the holy people of God. And Jesus is replacing the law. He is the law, as Paul put it. Just to, to take another example, this time in the area of uh, forgiveness of sins, Jesus claiming authority, personal authority to forgive sins. He does that sometimes by word, like your sins are forgiven you, as he does with that story of the paralytic who's laid lower down from, through the ceiling by his four friends. Sometimes he does it by the table of fellowship, forgiving sinners by eating with them. It's something that uh, you never find a prophet doing that. Prophets are against sin. Uh, sorry, it was quoted yesterday, the uh, Calvin Coolidge, and uh, to put it mildly, prophets were against sin, and uh, it was the preacher that Calvin Coolidge heard on Sunday. But uh, <coughs> the, Jesus claims the right to forgive sins. 
Amazing story that the four anonymous men, presumably men, relatives, perhaps, or friends, opening up the roof and lowering the paralytic down in front of Jesus. Well, there's a lot of loose ends in that story. Did they come back to repair the roof? Or <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the baker? What happened to the guy who was cured? And so on. But that notable story of the cure of the paralytic has been raining people. It begins with, um, or some of the people, begins with the forgiveness of sins. What Jesus does invisibly, forgiving sins, is symbolized and established, witnessed to by his authority in healing the man. And a very suggestive version used about that, the man was raised. Uh, again, a divine passive. Was raised. You know, I say to you, you know, get up and pick up your pallet and go home. And the man does get up and he was raised. The divine passive is used. It leaves it open. Who is working there? Is it God? Is it God? But is God working through Jesus that uh, using the divine passive deliberately on the tip of the part of the mark and putting that question to us who he reads? So all in all, when you think of the teaching of Jesus, one can readily understand how towards the end of his uh, uh, earthly ministry, a number of people got the point that he was setting himself on a power with God. He gave the impression during his ministry of that, of understanding himself to be on a par with God. Members of the Sanhedrin, specifically the high priest, they charged Jesus with blasphemy. He was doing something that for them was blasphemous, claiming divine prerogative, putting himself on a level with God. There's that Rabbi Jacob Neusner, I'm not sure he's still alive, but he was um, quoted in Pope Benedict's volume one of his uh, two volumes on Jesus and Nazareth. And um, the Pope ended in a certain dialogue with that rabbi who lives in, I think he lives in Canada, maybe America. But Neusner in his book about Jesus said, uh, through the conclusion, Jesus makes demands that only God can make. And I think that's a better be quoted that as a fair summary of the import, the drift of Jesus' teaching. He was making demands, claiming things that only God can claim and do. And then you come back to the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of God, and the Son of Man who will be the central figure of the glory to come. What about the final rule of God? Jesus preached not only a kingdom was breaking into the world through his preaching and miracles, but also a kingdom to come, the final rule of God. And he claimed to have a supremely uh, authoritative role in that. I mean, he is he for those who can share in the last kingdom. He told, for example, the 12 disciples, I assigned to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, so that you may sit, eat and drink at my table in the kingdom to come. So here he is assigning uh, life, feasting, the heavenly banquet in an authoritative way to the group of his disciples. He does that kind of language more often by using the term son of man, that mysterious type of the self-designation he gave himself. In the New Testament, Paul and others don't use that term because it's to mean everything from I, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head, but I have no home, I'm homeless right through to this, you know, the coming Son of Man who will judge people in a divine way. It had an enormous range of meanings, that term Son of Man, and uh, Jesus seems to have deliberately chosen that, so leaving open to people, you know, what's the real answer? Who is the Son of Man? The son, you know, in Daniel, we were a rather heavenly figure there, and so by using it, he, he left things open and to encourage people to think about his identity. Well, apropos of our final relationship with God, Jesus would say such things as this, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So he is the Son of Man, 
that denying or accepting him here and now will be highly relevant to one's destiny in the kingdom to come. So he understood the future and final salvation of human beings to depend on their relationship to him here and now. So he's making high claims about his function and identity for the uh, eternal salvation of human beings. And Jesus was convinced that he would have that decisive authority. Think about the Son of Man who's coming in judgment. He not only comes in judgment, but he comes with the clouds of heaven. That's the scenario for God. He comes with great power and angels. Once again, it's a divine scenario. And he sits upon the chair of judgment and on the throne of glory. The kind of language that uh, the language we use for God over and over again in the Jewish scriptures. So here he is in Matthew 25 and elsewhere, judging the nations. And so who did he think he was if he could claim that future role as divine judge? Who did he think he was if he could present himself as finally being supremely authoritative? Well, I've been dealing with implicit claims made by Jesus that he, often enough these claims are implied by the things that he says and does. And in preaching the present and future kingdom, uh, Jesus is saying things that bring that question up. What's the personal authority in mediating God's present and future reign that he's laying claim to? They're largely implicit claims in the Synoptic Gospels. When you get to John, of course, it's I am the light of the world, and those I am saying are very explicit in what's being claimed. But in the Synoptic Gospels, it's more at the implicit level that claims are put forward. That, of course, doesn't mean they're second rate claims. When you talk about implicit and explicit claims, it's simply distinguishing between ways of making a claim. In human affairs, we can claim things implicitly by the things we do, and that can be a high claim, not a second-rate claim. So the distinction between the implicit and the explicit in matters of claim, that's a, a matter of secondary importance. It's simply the way in which the claim is made. It says nothing for or against the claim that is being made. But you do get some in the Synoptic Gospels explicit claims, and the starting example would come at the high point in Mark's Gospel when uh, Jesus is questioned by the high priest, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus responds explicitly, I am. I am the Christ, the Son of uh, the Blessed One. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. There is something quite explicit in being affirmed there, and it leads the high priest to declare that Jesus has blasphemed. Some of you, maybe many of you will have seen Zavarelli's uh, film, Jesus of Nazareth, that one that came out, what, 25, 30 years ago, and uh, uh, was blessed by Providence. When he was putting together the team for that film, he asked Elizabeth Taylor to play the Blessed Virgin Mary. I don't know why, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what he did. And he, um, she turned it down. Because she said, I never do television work. Because originally that film was for British and Italian television. It wasn't originally for the cinema. So she turned it down on the grounds that she never did television work. And so got Elizabeth Hussey who was very successful. But apropos of the high priest questioning Jesus, you remember that marvelous scene of Anthony Quinn playing the high priest, tearing his robe, just appalled at this. Uh, statement of blasphemy as he took it with Jesus claiming uh, such a relationship with the with divine power with God. So uh, biblical studies I think can help us here dealing with the Gospels. They don't prove anything in the sense finally. Uh, one, one doesn't run the historical evidence uh, through a laboratory and then conclude well, Jesus claimed this is true and so on. Faith goes beyond that. If faith needs historical evidence, typically goes beyond historical evidence, but it should not be threatened by it. And in particular, biblical and historical scholarship should deal, does deal, with facile claims made about Jesus. You know, claims about him being merely a teacher, merely this or merely that. You had Philip Pullman a few years ago producing that book, 
baby Jesus was a twin, the good man Jesus and the scoundrel Christ. And I was very, there were biblical scholars that reviewed that, but a whole lot of very good journals, I remember like the Guardian, uh, London Financial Times and so on, all but one of these reviews, were about 30, 30 of them, were very good indeed. I was asked to write a reply to that book, but I thought well, I'll start with the reviews and see what they made of it. And uh, they were, with one exception, they were very good and pointed out how, you know, this just doesn't work. People have tried that before, that Jesus being a twin, sometimes claiming that he was the twin to Thomas. Thomas is called the twin, and well, who's his twin? Oh, Jesus. There's no evidence for that, but it doesn't matter. Let's run with that. So, this <laughs> scholarship, I think, can raise the questions about the identity of Jesus, deal with facile claims about him, and, uh, you know, be on the side of the faith. Well, so much for the Gospels. What about Paul, the first Christian writer? writing from about 49 to the early 60s. And it, you know, it's often been claimed that Paul misrepresents the Jesus of history and introduces faith in Christ as divine law. That he's uh, doing something remarkably new, turning Jesus, uh, you know, a holy man, a wonderful teacher, a messianic liberator perhaps, but then turning him into the Son of God and Lord. Well, was he doing that? Did Paul do just that? It's like a lot of things people say about Paul that they don't uh, stand up to close scrutiny like Paul being an angry woman. When you read the images, he uses about himself as a nursing mother. It's a remarkable language that Paul uses. Uh, and I, you know, his great friend Phoebe. Phoebe's given the letter to the Romans, I suppose, his most precious book. words are said and used gives a clue, a clear clue to their meaning. In the uh, Hebrew Bible, did you know that Yahweh is a sacred name for him and he could be saved? When they came to it in the text, they were replaced it by Adonai. They didn't read Yahweh, but read Adonai, Lord. And in the Septuagint, that became, as you know, Kurios or Lord. So uh, Paul and the first Christians, they took that sacred name and applied it uh, not just to the one true God, but to, to Jesus. He's there, uh, believed on and worshipped from the very first Christian communities, above all, through the term Lord. Paul does use sometimes Son of God, but only about 15 times. But Lord, Kurios, is very central in his vocabulary. And I like that prayer at the end of 1 Corinthians, Maranatha. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Come Lord Jesus. It's a prayer in Aramaic and transliterated into Greek, and it's shared there by Christians around the Mediterranean world, not just in the Holy Land, in the Mother Church of Jerusalem, but also Paul knew, used and understood in Corinth by the Greek Christians. 
And it's the same prayer as the one that ends the Bible in the book of Revelation, Come Lord Jesus. And in this way, Christians uh, express their faith in prayer to the risen and exalted Lord as, as divine, Come Lord Jesus. Paul just simply takes that over. He doesn't introduce, he's not the one who introduced that prayer. He was there when he came on the scene. <coughs> and the first Christians needed no argument. They, they worship Christ that way, use that language of him, and Paul uh, synchronizes himself with them. One central passage in Paul that turns up here about the usage of law, Lord is the hymn in Corinthians, uh, Philippians, rather, Philippians chapter 2, that uh, mainly Paul wrote it, uh, maybe he took it over and, and, and altered it a bit. It doesn't matter because either way he knows that he's people to whom he's writing will accept what he's writing. He's not introducing a start in the new doctrine to what he's saying in that hymn, or repeating that hymn about Christ being in the form of God and equal to God, and then sharing the divine name, Curios, at the end. It's the common faith being expressed there that the community, in this case Philippi, up there in the north of Greece, shares with Paul. Regularly, Paul himself takes passages from the Old Testament about God as Lord and applies them to Christ. Take uh, Joel, the prophet Joel, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And in Romans 10, Paul takes that passage and he understands that Jesus himself, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, that is to say Jesus, uh, will be saved. Over and over again, Paul reads passages from the Old Testament about God as Lord and finds them fulfilled in, um, uh, in the case of Christ. And repeatedly, he doesn't need your argument about it, he simply says it. He knows that the community to whom he's writing that letter will have win with him. And that's so in Philippians as well. When you come to the end of for that hymn in Philippians, you have that language about <coughs> heaven and earth, and every knee bow and rest. It evokes Isaiah chapter 45. That section in Isaiah is very strong on monotheism. One of the great passages <coughs> about monotheism is being echoed by Paul there, passage in Isaiah 45. God determines everything, heaven and earth, and every need, not just some, but everyone uh, worshipping the Creator. So the uh, uh, worshipping him as Lord. And that enables Paul to apply that to Christ. Either he does it or the hymn did it before him. Either way, it doesn't matter. Paul asserts there that Christ is the one who is all determining, Lord of heaven and earth and every knee bowing before him. Something that Paul clearly, I think pretty clearly, did create was the salutation at the beginning of letters. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's more convincing to understand that as as an introduction of Paul himself coin. A very interesting bringing together of Jewish and Gentile thoughts. Charis, grace, Greek, and then peace or shalom. So Paul even there is keen on the union between Gentiles and Jews, that, uh, that in his very salutation of the Christians he's addressing them in that way. But the more important thing for me this morning here is the way in which he understands salvation comes not just from God and the Father, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation is integral in the sense it's charis, it's grace, and peace. Two words hinting at or pointing to integral salvation, the whole redeemed deal that comes to us from Christ. And in that salutation, you find Jesus put on the same level as God, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sadly, there's no mention of the Holy Spirit there, but what we have is a placing together of, of Christ and the Father. The mark of a Christian, Paul, was a confession of Jesus as Lord. In 2 Corinthians, that he proclaims Jesus Christ as Lord, and himself as a servant for your sake. So the, to be a Christian means for Paul, above all, to confess Christ and confess him as Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. 
No one can confess Christ as Lord except through the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit to bring people to that point that they're able to confess Christ as divine Lord. So Paul defines, describes Christianity that way as confessing Jesus as, as Lord, as divine Lord. Perhaps the most startling example of Paul using the language of law, the Lord comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. When Paul takes the Jewish confession, the Shema, here O Israel, and the confession of God is one, and he puts Christ right in that confession. He takes the language, the very language of the central Jewish confession of God as one, and puts Christ alongside the Father. For us Christians, there is one God the Father, from whom all things, and in whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are, and through whom we exist. So he places right at the heart of the Shema, the one Lord Jesus Christ, and assigns to him the divine role of creation. You have Paul redefining uh, Jewish monotheism there. He's not saying there are three gods or two gods, but that God is one, that the oneness of God embraces you know, the, here the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So uh, a very remarkable passage that, not only giving the divine name of Jesus, but also the divine prerogative of creating human beings in their universe. And once again, it's important to remember that Paul doesn't try to prove that, he simply states it. He knows that agree with it. And in that first letter to Corinthians, he's got to argue for certain things, like he's against disorder in the church and he wants discernment of spiritual gifts. He's got to remind them of the truth of the resurrection and so on. There's quite a number of very essential things that Paul argues for in 1 Corinthians. But here in chapter 8, he doesn't argue for this redefinition the Shabbat. He simply states it, he knows they'll agree with him and, and moves on. He portrays Jesus that way and he knows it's a way that they will accept happily in their faith. Well, a final remark about Paul, he left us the first Thessalonians, maybe not his greatest document, but still the first Christian document we have, written about 49 AD. And in that very first letter, by Paul, not the masterpiece, which I suppose is Roman. Uh, he calls Jesus by the title of Lord 24 times. Quite a lot, that, isn't it? And then when he comes to the future resurrection, our resurrection, he calls him Lord there uh, something like six times. He doesn't use the language of Son of Man. Jesus has used the Son of Man about the coming um, judgment, implying also resurrection. And Paul no speaks about coming resurrection six times in terms of Christ as the Lord. And as I said earlier, it's about 230 times that Paul uses in his uh, certainly authentic letters the, the title of Lord for Christ. So I think you find that remarkable testimony to Paul's faith in Christ as kurios, the faith that he shared with the communities that he found and to whom he wrote. Well, these are a couple of conclusions I could draw about uh, from the Gospels and then from Paul about the self-consciousness of Jesus and uh, which became explicit here and there according to the Synoptic Gospels, especially at the trial of Jesus, and then Paul's language. We go beyond historical conclusions about Jesus when we come to faith. You know, the experience of worship and the experience of the saints can be much more decisive. There are many things that can feed into Christian faith and entertainment. It would be very interesting for me to hear like, from you what, what supports your faith and how, how you came from faith. Presumably there's some here who came from non-faith to faith. Others, of course, are great and Christian. But there's, there's much more to it than simply historical conclusions. But they do play their part. They're a good history can deal with weird theories, wacky ideas about Jesus, and, and also pose the question. And then the um, followers of Jesus, I suppose, in the creation and making of our faith, that the holy women and men that we know, and that we know they, they can be very key in our story of faith. And also to Jesus as an answer to questions. We have these basic questions about what life
life is and you know where are we going and what's the meaning of suffering and the reason being sensible this you know and, and people you know, people can be tormented by those questions and in the end one finds yes this a mysterious answer but still a, a very true answer. One example I like to use here about historical evidence but going beyond it is people getting married. People don't get married simply on the basis of historical reflection and doing background checks on the person they're thinking of marriage. I think it'd be insulting for a young man to propose marriage to somebody saying, I've done background checks on you and we share our similar interests and so forth and our families can get together. And so I think our marriage will succeed. It'd be pretty insulting to go along that path. In Italy, uh, there was a firm called Terminal Investigations. Was it, in Italy, it was called Terminal Investigations. I don't know why, but that the English title of that firm. And it was in the business of being private detectives. I had a fantasy about Giuseppe, that's called him, being worried about his wife, uh, Rosa, and hiring somebody in Terminal Investigations to investigate her. And then a month later, they come back to Giuseppe and say, look, but nothing to worry about. I mean, he goes out in the morning, has coffee with his girlfriends, etc. There's no evidence whatsoever of infidelity. And would that be the beginning of his love for her, or would it be the end, just depending on something like that? <coughs> Use other examples for yourself, like thinking about, the, the, say, the man who was my father. Uh, you know, you could become, uh, I can, you could say, well, maybe my mother had a, uh, had a boyfriend not really the son of Patrick Francis O'Connor's and could I get his bones dug up to do a DNA test and, and if it would prove that I'm, you know, I am the son of that man, would that be the beginning of my relationship with my parents? I think it would be the end. <laughs> anyway, examples of examples. But uh, deep lasting relationships, deep lasting decisions are made not simply on the basis of evidence. Uh, as we know here in Australia, I think it's said well over 40% now of people uh, either not being born here or, or are born of parents who came here. And you know, that's an enormous risk challenge. It looks as if it would work if we leave Italy or Greece and I don't know, Vietnam and come to Australia, but you know, it's, it's a major decision. There's, there's evidence that plays a role, but also a personal commitment and courage. These are analogies, I think, that can be useful for saying something about the genesis of faith. And of course, let's not forget what Paul or Luke talks about in the Book of Acts, the interior illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Book of Acts tells the story of Paul making his first convert in Philippi, that woman called Lydia. And the Lord opened her heart. She not only listened to the word the external words of Paul, but her heart was open, and the heart has its reasons. There's the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit, the key factor in the coming to being and the continuance of faith. Yes, we need the external word, we need the text that we can study and hear, etc., but we also need the, the internal word of God, the, the Lord opening our heart. Paul puts it beautifully in 2 Corinthians about the hearts of human beings uh, being blessed so that they can know the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. And if we help people to do just that, come to a sense of the beauty of God on the face of Christ, we've really done everything. If there's anything I can do for people, that I might just give them a sense of the beauty of Christ. We fall in love with beautiful people. And Paul more than hints at that in 2 Corinthians chapter for seeing the glory of God, the beauty of God in the face of Christ. And people who fall in love with him will stay in love with him and, and faith will live that way. Well, I began this lecture by talking about theology and Christology and soteriology and, 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 and faith above all at the end. Uh, it's a wonderful example that I used to collect some of them with people coming to faith. One example was Malcolm Muggeridge, that English writer. He, um, he did a lot of study of books on the scriptures. He studied the scriptures, the New Testament, and uh, he wrote about things. 
but there was no resurrection there, there was no real faith in him. But then a couple of things happened in Margaret. He, he visited the Holy Land, and he saw the shining faces of pilgrims. He saw people just transfigured, you know, their shining faces, as he put it, visiting the uh, holy sites in the land where Jesus was born, lived, and died. And then he went on from there, or he'd gone before to Calcutta to see Mother Teresa, and experienced the Holy Land with that saintly woman. They helped Malcolm Martin to come to in full faith in Christ. Not that he more studied, or that he read more books, but, but the experience of these people did the trick for him. Saintly witnesses to Jesus, like those pilgrims and Mother Teresa, they work in a way that uh, is necessary. And more than ever, of course, we need those people, those witnesses to Christ. We certainly need good biblical scholarship and historical scholarship, uh, and that can feed into our faith in Christ. But we need even more, I think, the witness of holy men and women that we see exemplified in that passage of faith of that British writer Malcolm Martin. So on that note, let me make a massive act of self-discipline and stop. <laughs> What we will then do, uh, in advance of previous conferences, is to thank both speakers. Uh, primarily, I will give a more elaborate thanks to Jared, because last night Phil, uh, of course, uh, uh, has already thanked Demetrius. So, uh, first of all, our questions, and then I'll thank both speakers, and then we go to morning. So, okay, questions?
the third paragraph on your handout, um, saying Jesus was sent to break Satan's power. Um, I, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that. And of course, I think you know the reason why I ask, and, and that's because uh, in Byzantine theology, that's not the purpose um, usually associated with God becoming human. So it's just, yeah, some clarification on, on that third paragraph where um, you say Jesus was sent to break Satan's power. Well, it was also sent to them. It's not, you know, that he talks about that. I mean, he, I mean, I just love to make room there for his um, uh, angel. He, you know, I, I, I don't think one can surrender the you know, exorcisms of Christ. You know, the diabolic possession, whatever one makes of it, he was it was in combat with the forces of evil. So that's part of the, especially in Mark's gospel, it's a big, it's a big part of the story there. Perhaps less in Matthew and Luke, but still there. So that's what I was. Uh, that's the language he uses about himself. He, he doesn't say this is the only thing I've come to do, because obviously he's doing other things. He, he's teaching parables and he's teaching uh, the attitudes and so on. So, uh, yes, it does. It, it's, well, I would have asked you to say I was also sick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but he, uh, he got the God's kingdom clashing with the kingdom of Satan. It's, it's Joel Marcus in that great commentary on Mark's gospel, that's, that's a very central theme for him. It's not the only thing, but you know, the clash of the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God and Jesus being sent you know, as, as key to break Satan's power. Because Satan, you know, you know, devils and Satan and so on, it's kind of language that people, you know, are a bit uncomfortable with. Uh, but then you get some, I was really struck a few years ago when the Yugoslavia was breaking up, and uh, there was a great uh, Jewish, secular Jewish writer of the London Times. His name evades me at the moment, but he was a very good writer indeed. And he, there he was as this kind of secular, non believing, more or less non believing Jew, but he said he had a kind of whiff of Satan there. The whole thing didn't make any sense, you know, what was happening in that, that terrible war. You know, maybe a hundred more than a hundred thousand people died. He thought about twenty thousand would die. The terrible damage it did. You know, it was just insane. And he, he did not think that human beings could do a thing like that. That unless there was some force that was bigger than them. I mean, it, it gave me pause reading, the, you know, what he said and the awful evil that seems to have a face that's larger than human. Anyway. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, do you think that way in which um, the New Testament refers to the resurrection of Jesus points to his divinity? The resurrection? The way the resurrection oh, yes. of Jesus does that point to his divinity? Well, eventually, of course, you know, I have the resurrection of life. There's a language in John's Gospel. Um, but it's you know, it's a vindication by God, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's rejected as a blasphemer and, uh, you know, he dies as Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, but false king, you know, a messianic pretender. So he had the human judgment passed on him and then the divine judgment. One way people have read the resurrection story, you know, two judgments, you know, I think, fair enough. And it's quite certain that the of that title, you know, and uh, the, you know, the false led king of the Jews. And um, the first way of talking about his resurrection was uh, one of the way of Mark's gospel, uh, he has been raised, and he is not here, see the place where they laid him. You move into the great truth, he has been raised, and then he is not here in the tomb, and see the very place where they laid him. It's coming from big down to the specific place. Well, he has been raised, 
uh, air is passive, and that um, was raised. Then, then you gradually move to the language of John, which was more familiar to us, which we tend to use, I suppose, as Christian. You know, he rose from the dead in his own power. But the, the earlier way is the way thinking more of him as human, as, as a human being, he's dead and buried, that's it. But you know, as divine, he, uh, he has the power to raise himself. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, above all for the early Christians, it's, it's, it's what the resurrection brought them. It's sticking with Mark's gospel, you know, the women walk into the new day, dawn is breaking. It's, it's very symbolic that, that, that they're walking into a day on which the sun will never set. And, um, uh, and they, and they, you know, they don't see Jesus in Mark's gospel. Um, there's a promise of it, but um, and a promise that he'll give a rendezvous with Peter and the others in Galilee. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a vindication by God that it's the beginning of the end of the world too. You know, it, it, those very cryptic symbols in the resurrection narratives about the earthquake and you know, nature being involved. And, uh, it's not spelled out in any detail, but I think we're more than justified in reading them you know, symbolically. You know, Expressions anticipating the, the fullness of the eschaton. We've had a bit of a pause about resurrection studies. We had that very big book by N.T. Wright a few years ago. I think Gary Habermas is, uh, in the States is writing another big one. Uh, I'd like to see more writing from oh, people like medical doctors. There was a pretty good article a few years ago in the Irish. Theological quarterly Habermas was exegete, and then this doctor about, you know, that uh, Paul and the others, they were hallucinated. Well, the, the doctor said, well, they don't know the least thing about what, how hallucination works. He was a medical practitioner, you know, that they make this stuff up, and, you know, the, the chain reaction of people that one thinks they saw him with others, and the condition, the little we know. Uh, it's not a huge amount, it doesn't bear that out. But if you know, one wants to use that language at least, you know, at least hear what the ex experts have to say about what it is. It's a good example of uh, bad example of the way in which resurrection is rejected. But, uh, what did you actually have? Did you have something more than that in mind, the, the question? No, I think, I think that's. that's What does Balkan's commentary upon the evidences add to the Gospels? Is he just rebutting the naysayers? Well, he, if you find it before the Gospels were written, they were coming into existence, being material in the Gospels, being passed on by eyewitnesses, maybe by little notebooks and things. So he might have been. He doesn't say a great deal about it. The material, but he just says that Jesus was the house of David, being in Rome, and then he died by crucifixion. Um, you never hear about Jesus' miracles in him. And, and, you know, was that put here in the so called teaching Didache, which was you know, happening around him? And he concentrates on the central theology of the crucifixion, resurrection and uh, applying them to people's situations. Uh, you know, a few sayings by Jesus quoted by him, but not much at all. You think about a page, I suppose, you put together all that he says about the story of Jesus and Nazareth. Um, but the, there are people around him. You know, he tells us in Galatians of spending a couple of weeks with Peter. Well, presumably, Peter's telling him about Jesus. Paul wasn't there in the ministry. They're not just talking about the weather. <laughs> so, so I think um, they, and along comes Mark, who writes the first gospel, which is extraordinary step to make. It is a kind of ancient biography, but uh, Richard.
Christian burial, you know, it's like the argument of that case. That one understands the Gospels and forms of ancient biography, but, uh, but to the way you know, the Gospel, Paul uses the word Gospel as a message, and then, and then when you get to the Bible, you know, it becomes a book. It's a passage from a message to a book, and uh, followed then by the other. So, I don't Paul, Paul obviously didn't feel he, he would be disadvantaged there, of course. He, he got it in gospel way. I mean, he would have been getting this from the eyewitnesses, what he heard from Peter and so on. And, you know, that, that would have been not himself, but others being prominent. Because Paul was, you know, insisted on his own authority. He was an apostle. Yes, the last one, the sinful one, but, uh, it, you know, one that was all essentially on the same rank as that. Professor, just in relation to that, um, to, to the question, your answer to the question, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, could you infer perhaps that, uh, that uh, St. Paul wasn't interested in necessarily reconstructing the life of uh, of Jesus, his earthly sojourn, because he had a continuing experience of Jesus. As we read in the book of Acts, the Lord appearing to him continuously, which plugs into what you said earlier about the experience of the saints. Yeah. The, uh... yeah, so he's yeah, talking yeah. to him, in other words. I mean, the spirit of Jesus is, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And the mate, Luke, of course, too, in the book of Acts, you get Luke talking about, you know, Paul and others doing things because they were prompted by the Spirit, or prompted by Jesus. I mean, Luke passes from one to the other without pausing to make them too hard. But, um, but he, um, and yet on the other hand, he, he doesn't, he certainly doesn't want something that's, uh, free floating, you know, you can have a spiritual gospel and not pin down the history of, you know, Jesus, the son of David according to the flesh. It's very important in the beginning of Rome. We're going to hear a bit more about it later this morning, but I think he, I think it's simply that people were around doing the teaching about the story of Jesus. I mean, people we know, like Peter himself and Mary Magdalene and those people that Paul, that Luke refers to briefly in reading the gospel, and they're doing it. So Paul doesn't get into that. You know, some are apostles, some are teachers. I think he he uh, he, he wants to. His faith in Christ is very concrete. When you come to Second Corinthians, the things that happen to him, you know, uh, fleeing from Damascus and being flogged, and, you know, the. Uh, it's very becomes more specific than later the older Paul gets. Uh, yes, led by the Spirit. And, uh, and, you know, pneumatology is very important to him, but, but also I think you know, there's never a doubt that it's very important to him that Jesus is, you know, from the Jewish people. You know, the, he's the end of the law and so on. He dies by crucifixion. Some few basic things. High in into history, and Paul doesn't. Um, but he doesn't go into details. If he was started to just give us the parables, presumably they're allowable already. The oral witnesses and giving them. So, what's the point of him doing that? I think uh, he never says that, but it's a guess of mine. But, you know, he life short. He was terribly involved in. Helping his communities like a mother, but, uh, but you know the, the other was being attended to. The dinner was being attended to by others. Um, just a, a, a concern. Um, I'm very taken by <coughs> your <coughs> sorry your initial um, insistence that of course faith is something which goes beyond the cerebral. You know, to something that's almost indefinable, but it is beyond knowing about the facts. They may contribute a bit, but they're um, not, certainly not all there is. And I just wondered whether 
we're in line with the, um, then the further discussion about the resurrection, um, we have ten tended to have this um, preoccupation as Christians with how we can explain and convince people about the reality of the resurrection. And I wonder if you had any comment about that extraordinary bit at the end of Matthew, where um, it's not just about disciples saying, and it's wonderful we've seen the risen Lord in, you know, in various places, and then Paul, but you get the Jewish authorities worrying at the end of Matthew and saying, look, um, He's clearly risen, but we don't want people to, you know, get too preoccupied with this, that to be dangerous to us. So simply having um, the factual evidence of the empty tomb there isn't necessarily for everyone um, a, a, an urge towards faith. You know, it can be something that you actively choose to reject for whatever your own agenda is. You know, at the end of Matthew, you know, when the soldiers reported on the um, tomb being empty, and the Jewish authorities say, let's, um, uh, you must be silent about that, you know, we, we can't let people think that um, he's been resurrected. I wonder if you had any thoughts on how the end of Matthew works in that regard. Yes, well, the, it's only in Matthew you've got the guards yes. the tomb and the, uh, the they're set out against the women. The, the setting of the garden is the two women, and then you go back to the garden. And, and then here are these guards. It looks like the powers of this world have prevailed. And Jesus is dead in a tomb and being guarded. And yet God intervenes with the angel of the Lord, not just an angel. And the guards become like dead men. Very it's a wonderful irony in that. They think they're guarding a dead person and they, they look like yes. dead men themselves. And it's very reminiscent of what you get at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, you know, the angel of the Lord rescuing the Holy Family. It's only in the beginning of the end of Matthew's Gospel that you get the angel of the Lord, you know, appearing to Joseph and rescuing the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary and Jesus. And the, so, uh, there's a, there's a kind of, the friends of God may be weak and it's few like the two women, but God prevails. And I think Matthew was saying, saying that. He's also talking about money, about the, the, the soldiers go into town and get the money, and the, there's not much talk about money in Matthew's Gospel, except in bad situations like Jew, Judas accepting money, 30 pieces of silver. You've got the parable of the talents, but that's a parable, but generally speaking, uh, money gets a bad press in Matthew's Gospel. And then, one marvellous thing about that last chapter in Matthew is the, Jesus is just called Jesus. It's not, he's just named by his historic name. And, and here's Matthew who quoted scripture so much up to chapter 27. And these things were said or done in order to fulfil it prophecy. And yet when it comes to the uh, resurrection of Jesus, he doesn't do that. He simply uh, just tells the story and calls Jesus not Lord or anything, but just Jesus. So, and then uh, the amazing sending out at the end, the, with a great emphasis on universality, teaching them to do all, all things, and go into the whole world and teach every creature. Uh, so, Christ is the all-determining one. Yeah. You know, there's a great sense of that at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matthew, the ending of Matthew's Gospel, people love the ending of John's Gospel and Luke and so on, the Emmaus story. But I think the, the chapter 28 of Matthew is, is very rich spiritually uh, you know, also, but it has to be teased out a bit. But one of the little thing, Matthew tells us that the women fled from the tomb in fear and trembling. But Matthew thinks that they're in fear and great joy. And there's not much talk about great joy in Matthew's Gospel except at the beginning of the main guy. There's much joy. I mean, the guy that finds the treasure, great joy. But, but just a little touch, and think surely it's, it's fear all right, but great joy.